Coming up, a man using kittens on the side of the road in a possible plot to lure women. Taking the wrong prescription can have serious consequences. We look at how often medication mistakes actually happen. Plus, why virtual learning might stick around long after the pandemic is over. Valley News Live at 10 starts right now. This is Valley News Live at 10. It was terrifying, like absolutely terrifying. I've never, I've never been so scared. That Minnesota woman has a warning for you tonight involving a scary situation with a man and cats. Valley News Team's crime and safety reporter Bailey Hurley spoke exclusively with that woman today, who says she feels like this is a new ploy to take advantage of and possibly harm women. The trip from Fargo back home to Minoman is a drive Brittany Bellinger has made many times, but Bellinger says Sunday night's journey has changed the course of all future travels from here on out. I won't be traveling alone anymore, probably ever. I never thought in a million years that something like that would happen. Bellinger says she was in between State Highway 9 and Haterdahl around 930 Sunday night when she saw something on the side of the road. There was a box and I seen a kitty. So my first thought is, what if there's kittens in there? Like, what if somebody dumped off a litter of kittens? She says there wasn't a soul in sight, so she turned around and pulled up next to the box and cat. She says that's when a dark four-door car pulled up behind her out of nowhere with a man behind the wheel. And he said, what's going on? I said, I'm just checking on this kitty. And he looks and he said, so what are you up to tonight? As he gets out of his car, and my first thought is, uh-uh, I'm not, no. So I jump back in my truck and I like just throw it and drive and I gunned it, man, I was out of there. Bellinger says as she drove away, she checked her rear view mirror and saw the man get back into his car and speed off the opposite way. I feel like the cat was set out there because women are more likely to stop for cats. She's now urging women in the valley to think twice and always listen to your instincts. In Clay County, Bailey Hurley, Valley News Live. Bellinger adds that a friend drove through that same area shortly after, but she says the box, cat, and car were all gone. She describes the man as 5 feet 9 inches tall, a medium build, and says the car could be an older model Chevy Impala. A report has been filed with the Clay County Sheriff's Office. Fargo police are still on the lookout tonight for several people tied to yesterday morning's shooting at the Arbor's apartment in South Fargo. A 24-year-old woman was seriously wounded and a man named Jerome Kuhn has been arrested on several charges, but police say he's not the only suspect. Metro Plains management says they have been in close contact with Fargo police and have given them access to cameras on their property. Anyone that is identified on site as being involved in criminal activity or allowing guests with criminal activity is evicted very swiftly. Fargo police have set up a tip line for anyone with information and for those who may feel unsafe living in that area. That phone number, 241-1431. New information tonight on the state taking over the federally funded refugee resettlement program in North Dakota. The move comes after Lutheran Social Services unexpectedly closed its doors, shutting down that and several other programs. Valley News Team Stacy Van Dyke joins us now with details. Stacy. Andrea, after getting formal notification Friday that LSS was out and there are no other agencies of its kind in the state, the refugee resettlement program basically fell into the lap of the Department of Human Services. As administrator, it'll work with providers which handle most of the legwork in resettling refugees. We spoke with Chris Jones, who heads up the Department of Human Services. He says he's not trying to reinvent the wheel. They're in the process of trying to find former LSS employees who worked with the program. A dozen will be needed to work as temporary employees of the state and operate out of their homes. He told us with no heads up from LSS, right now the department is just trying to pick up the pieces. Andrea. All right, thanks Stacy. The number of refugees accepted each year is set by the president. North Dakota settled 124 in 2019, 44 in 2020. Medication mistakes, errors that may have happened to you or a loved one. Our national investigative team found thousands of those mix-ups happen every year, sometimes with harmful or deadly consequences. Investigate TV's Sandra Jones talks to doctors about how this happens and what you can do to check your meds. At first it was shock. Uh, immediately 
after his expense, I, I caught it. Looking back, Al Carter regrets the day he gave the wrong medication to a 12-year-old. Completely and profusely apologized. After calling the family, he said they returned to the pharmacy to get the right antibiotic medication, and it turned out okay. It was one of those things where it was myself and another pharmacy technician in there, the two prescriptions, two different patients sitting right there because I knew they were waiting, and I grabbed the wrong one to give to the patient. Carter, who is now the executive director and CEO of the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, says similar packaging and names of prescriptions are the most common causes of medication mistakes. I think it's truly oversight. According to a 2017 study published in Clinical Toxicology, there are nearly 1.5 million medication errors each year in this country. That's one every 21 seconds. Why do you think these medication errors are still happening? Does it come down to the doctor's fault or the pharmacist or both? I, you know what? I think it's I think it's a little bit of, of both. NYU doctor Danielle Ofri has done extensive research and written books on medical mistakes. The vast majority of errors, medication or otherwise, are committed by very competent, caring clinicians. And maybe there's a momentary oversight or someone's overburdened. Patients like Amanda Payne Lindsay, who never imagined it would happen to her. I was felt like I had heightened depression, heightened anxiety. Finally, Payne Lindsay discovered she was taking the wrong medication. She said she was supposed to get a specific birth control. Instead, she was given a different combination of hormones. I didn't think twice about checking the name of what I was taking um, because my physician prescribed it. The pharmacist acknowledged what it was. Payne Lindsay said she started feeling better after she stopped taking that medication and was prescribed a new one. She filed a claim with the hospital and received this response from its insurance company confirming the mistake. I had no reason to really question that it was even wrong, especially within the hospital system that owns the pharmacy. According to the study of Poison Control Center data, reports of medication errors doubled between 2000 and 2012. Now, researchers at the Mayo Clinic say, know your medications and the possible side effects. Don't hesitate to ask questions or share concerns with your doctor. Keep an updated list of all of your medications. Save the information sheets that come with your medications. Use the same pharmacy for all of your medications. And when you pick up a prescription, make sure it's the one your doctor ordered. Important advice that Amanda Payne Lindsay will keep in mind for the future. It could have ended up very bad. Sandra Jones, Valley News Live. Amanda Payne Lindsay is currently waiting on response to the claim that she filed against that Illinois hospital. The city of Moorhead is in need of a new mayor. Mayor Jonathan Judd has been appointed by the governor to serve as district court judge in Minnesota's 7th Judicial District. He will be replacing the Honorable Barbara Hansen and will be chambered at Fergus Falls in Ottertail County. Judd was elected in 2018. His term wasn't set to end until 2022. Two members of the North Dakota National Guard who were deployed to Washington, D.C. for the inauguration have returned home with COVID-19. We tested them before they went out. We tested them again last night when they came home. We had two individuals test positive for COVID. Uh, so we are going through that process right now uh, to notify everyone, uh, isolate them, uh, make sure they have testing available so they can come out of isolation as soon as possible. Uh, they will remain in a federally paid status until that's uh, concluded. The Major General says with more than 26,000 troops in D.C. from all over the country, they're very lucky to only have returned home with two COVID cases. It's now confirmed a Minnesota patient is the first known case in the U.S. of the COVID-19 variant coming out of Brazil. Health officials say that person lives in the Twin Cities metro and had recently traveled to Brazil. They add this variant is believed to be more contagious than the initial virus strain that causes COVID-19, but it's not known if it's more severe. COVID vaccine maker Moderna today announced it's developing a booster shot to protect against newly emerging variants of the virus. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz will this week propose a two-year budget with a heavy focus on helping Minnesota recover from the impacts of COVID-19. 
The budget that the governor is planning to announce tomorrow is expected to top $50 million. It's going to emphasize assistance to small businesses, help for working families, and measure to get students caught up after a year of mostly distance learning. Lawmakers must adopt a balanced budget before the current one expires on June 30th. With teachers and students now familiar with the virtual learning, some North Dakota lawmakers are hoping to keep it around at least for emergency purposes. Lawmakers are learning more about House Bill 1232. It would allow students to attend classes virtually if their school were to close for weather or other conditions. The bill gives school districts the authority to approve a virtual education plan if needed, but it also specifies that school districts must have at least 95% student participation in the virtual instruction and provide excellence for it as well. Each district will have to have a specific plan on what works in virtual education, which we'll develop with our partners at ND United, NDCEL, uh, Small Rural Schools Association. We'll, we'll bring all these folks together to create these admin rules for districts to, uh, to create their application. Adoption would be optional for school districts. Nobody testified against that bill. Still ahead tonight, the impeachment proceedings have moved to the Senate. The latest on the process. But first, frigid temperatures expected to stay with us at least for a couple of days. Hutch has the details for you right after this break.